Okay, so it's more than likely that you've recently found yourself working from home, not by choice, but by necessity. As someone who's been working from home for more than a decade, I can tell you that working from home is kind of awesome. Your commute gets eliminated, you have a lot more control over how you set up your workspace, and technically, you don't even have to wear pants. That said, it also does come with certain challenges. When there are no bosses or coworkers around, it can be a lot harder to stay on task, and every decision becomes yours to make, which can be a little overwhelming when you're used to having your schedule at least partly set by someone else. The investor John Templeton once said that the four most expensive words in the English language are, this time, it's different. And you're probably familiar with this. Maybe you failed at a gym routine or a New Year's resolution, only to come back and say, this time it'll be different. This time I'll have more motivation, more willpower, more discipline, and I will win. But this is self-delusion, right? You don't just magically increase your willpower reserves overnight. You don't magically build habits overnight. These things take time. In fact, one study in the UK found that a habit can take on average 66 days to fully crystallize and become concrete. So if you just jump in and try to copy the morning routine of someone like Elon Musk or that blogger you read last week, the novelty might carry you through a couple of days, but that is far short of habit building territory and you're probably going to derail. Instead, pick a couple of habits that are meaningful to you and prove to yourself that you can do those consistently over time. Just stretch a bit beyond your comfort zone. And once you've established a new comfort zone, then add more. And since most of your overall goals are long-term ones, you need to know how to look beyond your daily schedule and effectively plan for the weeks and months ahead. So here are just a few techniques for keeping track of things on a larger scale and even dealing with things that don't have strict due dates. The way you start your day really matters. Waking up on time and going through a sequence of healthy habits can give you the momentum that you need to roll right into your work while waking up late or waking up without a plan can easily lead to procrastination and waste of time. For many, many years, I was that kind of person who would roll out of bed 15 or 20 minutes before my first scheduled thing, throw some clothes on, and basically rush out the door. I didn't have time to make breakfast, let alone read or do any of the other things that I wished I could have done. If you hit the snooze button in the morning, then you are accepting that the first thing you do that day is fail. And that made a lot of sense to me, because if you're going to set an alarm for yourself, you are essentially setting a goal for yourself. So instead of taking that extra 10 minutes of sleep, just grit your teeth, jump out of bed as fast as you can, and make that first act of the day a win. I think there are two main elements that you want to consider when setting up your workspace. Separation and isolation. So by separation, I'm talking about having a space that has a singular purpose. You want to set up a space that is only used for work, and then have another space that's used for relaxation. The surroundings that we put ourselves in have a certain amount of influence over our psychological states and in the choices that we make. So you want to make sure that your brain doesn't have to work too hard against your environment to stay on task. Secondly, you want to aim to be isolated from people who might interrupt you. So at my house, I've built a dedicated office that serves both of these purposes. I have a desk that I use for research and for writing, and then a reading area next to that. And if I need to, I can close the doors to that office and be alone in that room. But what if you don't have the room for a dedicated, isolated workspace? Well, when space is limited, you can either get creative, maybe putting your desk underneath a loft bed in your room, or you can turn to another resource that you have at your disposal, time. If you can't set up a permanent workspace, you can get into the habit of setting up a temporary one each day. And you can even make this part of your morning routine. Have your shower, make your breakfast, make your coffee, and then clear off a space on your kitchen table or get out a folding table. Next, let's talk about some tools and other physical items that can make a huge improvement in your workspace. Now, naturally, you're gonna to wanna to have any tools that are specific to your work close at hand and easily accessible, but there are a few more general items that I would like to bring to your attention as well. First, I have a whiteboard mounted to the wall right next to my desk. And every night I look at Todoist, I look at Google Calendar, and I write a list of everything that I'm gonna do the next day, preferably in the order that I'm going to do it. And I find that having this physical reminder of my priorities for the day right there in front of me and easily glanced up at is a great addition to my workspace. You might also consider keeping some plants around, like this dragon plant that I keep next to my reading area that I think really improves my workspace, and keep some healthy snacks and drinks around as well. For snacks, I like to keep carrots and almonds and apples around, and then for drinks, I have a fridge stocked with uh, sparkling water, and of course, I have lots of coffee and tea above that. And finally, I would recommend getting yourself a good pair of headphones. As much as I love to blast music over my speakers while I'm working, I think every good workspace should have a quality pair 
of headphones in it. Not only will this allow you to listen to whatever you want without disturbing anyone else, but more importantly, they can provide some isolation and help you stay focused. Potentially the most useful thing you can do when you sit down to work is to set a strong intention first. If you're anything like me, I'm sure you can think back to a time when you sat down and instead of working intentionally, you found yourself bouncing between mostly useless busy work tasks. Things like answering your email or checking your credit score. These tasks are easy and they give you an immediate feeling of accomplishment. So they're tempting to work on, but they also cause you to procrastinate on the work that you really should be doing, the work that's truly meaningful to you. So really they often end up being a net negative and setting a strong intention before you work helps you to avoid them at least until the real work is done. Now, one useful way of setting intentions is to follow the rule of three. This is a concept from Chris Bailey's book, The Productivity Project, and it's really simple. When you're writing out your daily plan, choose no more than three meaningful tasks that you intend to get done. Then when it's time to sit down for a session of focused work, look at your list and choose just one item to work on. Really mentally commit to devoting this working session only to that item. And just like that, you now have a strong intention that will help to guide you and keep you on task. Realize that the due dates in your task manager may not paint a perfect picture of what you should actually do today, or indeed what you can do today. Now, I say this because I know that I am guilty of continually allowing my intentions to eclipse my abilities. And if I don't stop myself, I will often write down way more tasks than I can realistically get done in any one given day. So try your best to keep this list limited to what you can actually do. And when you fail, and you will inevitably fail sometimes, make an observation of it so you can plan more accurately for the next day. I wanna show you a great method for breaking down large projects into manageable pieces and then tracking their progress. It's called the Kanban method and it's employed by teams everywhere around the world to get all sorts of huge projects done. At its core, Kanban uses cards and lists. Cards keep details about individual tasks, while the lists indicate the stages of the project. So as you work on tasks and move them to different stages, their respective cards get moved through the lists as well, so you always have an accurate bird's eye view of how things are going. If your computer or your phone are constantly distracting you and pulling your attention away from the work that you need to be doing, well, then you're really not gonna get much done. But luckily there are some tweaks you can make to that digital environment that are just as effective as the ones we've made to the physical one. If you don't need your phone for your work, and let's face it, you probably don't, then keep it out of arm's reach. Personally, I've been setting my phone to do not disturb mode for most of the day and also putting it on the printer at the other side of my office. So again, it's out of arm's reach. I also have it set so my favorite contacts can get through Do Not Disturb, so my phone does actually work as a phone, but everyone else gets silenced along with all app notifications. Your computer is also a huge potential distraction, and that is mostly due to the fact that it's connected to the internet. And if that's a particularly big problem for you, then you might want to actually disconnect it when you don't need it, either by disabling your Wi-Fi or by actually unplugging the ethernet cable. Now, once you've taken care of all those distractions, the last thing you need to figure out how to do is to get rid of the resistance you feel towards starting. And this is serious. Mental resistance towards difficult tasks is a big issue. For just one example, there was once a study done on people who felt high levels of anxiety towards doing math. And the study found that the mere anticipation of having to do math caused increased brain activity in some specific regions of the brain, namely those that deal with threat detection and even physical pain. And what this illustrates is that certain parts of our brain view difficult, mentally taxing tasks in the same way they would view touching a hot stove burn. Fortunately, this aversion that you feel towards difficult tasks really only affects you at the beginning. Once you get into it, you build up momentum that overcomes that resistance. So all you need to do is to reduce your resistance enough to get started. 